dance arrangement, very, very important, especially if you are changing your hours in any way. If it's just a flex day schedule, then that could be between you and your supervisor. But if you're changing your hours in any way, um, you do want to make sure the business officer knows that. All right. So there's lots of benefits, job satisfaction, individual morale. When you talk about giving a person the option to flex their schedule, um, work-life fit, um, health and well-being, just overall, they may feel less stressed may feel less burned out, they may feel less pressure, they may work even hard and get even more accomplished. Retaining your best workers because they feel like you're working with them to make sure and they are important. The productivity again, sometimes it's amazing how much we can get done in shorter time or just not having as many distractions. All right. Department morale and reducing burnout also. So one final tip I'll give you is when you are ready to submit a flexible work arrangement, you will go to the Work Life website and you there's some forms on there and you submit the information. Prior to doing that, though, you always want to have already had the conversation with your supervisor or manager to say, this is what I want to do. You've talked through those things I told you to consider. Consider the schedule, consider the impact on your team, consider your projects. You want to do all of that, have that conversation prior to submitting it. So when you submit it, it's pretty much like, I'm good with this. This person is just saying officially, yes, you can do this. All right, we're going to go on to Chris, talk about leave. It. Hold on one quick second. Are there any, in, do you have questions already? Okay, go ahead, please. Oh yeah, my name is Chris Bell, I'm the HR manager. Uh, in the area I'm going to talk about today, which is more almost important from office standpoint, First thing I think we always want to talk about is the flexibility of leave itself. Okay, there are no strict requirements about leave or not. And what the general duty clause says is that the employer is required to give an employee a workspace that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So again, what that's saying is you pay as an employer should be providing to their employee, regardless of where they're working at, a safe place. So when we start looking at these type of options, um, you know, one of the first things we would tell folks is they need to have defined job responsibilities. So if you're working from home, exactly what are you doing? And conversely, what are you not doing? Uh, same thing when it comes to work hours. So if you're working, let's say nine to three, and then you report some type of workplace injury at eight o'clock at night, first question is gonna be, well, what are you doing at eight o'clock at night doing your work? Where you already said that you're working, you know, until three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the other thing we'll be uh, advising folks is just general safety of your workplace. Uh, is there sufficient lighting and ventilation? Uh, are there extension cords or wires that the employee may be tripping over? Things like surge protectors for the computer, uh, if you have a, a monitor, a fax machine, something like that that you're working with, make sure all those type of things are, are secured. Um, is there a working smoke detector? Is there a fire extinguisher accessible? Is there a first aid kit available to the employee? These are all things that you should have at, at your home office, uh, much like you would if you were in the office. Um, also, does the employee have either renter's insurance or homeowner's insurance? Again, if something happens to uh, the workplace and university equipment is damaged or something happens to the employee, we want to make sure that, you know, that we try to mitigate uh, those losses as much as we can. Um, sometimes we would ask for a photo of your workplace. So not that we're going to come and audit it, but we want to kind of see it, make sure it looks like everything is, is going to pass muster. Uh, and again, make sure there's no recognizable hazards that would, uh, could cause any problems there. And then lastly, especially for those who are working at home and there's not a, a spouse or a significant other there, is to have emergency contacts. If all of a sudden you're supposed to be back from lunch and your supervisor can't get hold of you, you know, is there a neighbor, is there a spouse, is there somebody else we can contact? to make sure nothing has happened to you. Uh, so if there is, we can always dispatch emergency services. All right. Any 
questions. supervisor's perspective, and this may come as well in terms of things that they should do, just like the responsibility and safety of the work environment from a compensation perspective, the same sort of um, Department of Labor twists and lunges, for example, to that legislation is still applied to those kinds of work that are that are carried out in the office. And obviously, in a remote or teleworked situation, it's a lot harder to manage that. So um, it's important that supervisors have that the expectations from the schedule standpoint, the drinks and lunches, and to also have that regular follow-up to make sure that, uh, that they actually are in fact fulfilling their responsibilities from a perspective to the members and the staff members. Very good. Um, I found it from in telework situations, it's easy for employees to kind of blur the lines, you know, not take their full lunch or work at the computer while eating and not report that as time work. So obviously if you're working through lunch and it's an hourly employee, they do need to be paid for that. So that's where that regular follow-up is definitely important in a telework situation. Uh, secondly, when it comes to volumes, Azetta addressed this at the onset, but there may be situations where if you're in like a patient care environment an adjusted work schedule may not work in order to make sure that the patient's cared for and, and there's no gap there. And similarly, I, working on this campus, I know that many of us here in the departments have areas of peak volume. So like in registration, for example, start of the semester, whereas a, a telework situation or remote work where you might have worked during the summer, you may need to consider that, especially as a supervisor and understanding as an employee that they may need to make, there may be times where on site um, reporting is, is more necessary. And we touched on this, but from an exempt, non-exempt perspective, this more pertains to the supervisors, but in determining whether to grant or whether to facilitate a flexible working arrangement, just keep in mind the exemption status of the employee. Again, the wage and hour for non-exempt overtime comes into play. So it's something to consider especially in telework situations, you know, if you've got a work from home request that could encourage, you know, checking emails after office hours, you know, that's time that if it's a non-exempt employee, they've got, a, they've got a clock in and out, we have to pay. That type of flexible working arrangement could lead to unintended overtime. So it's something to consider before granting it. Um, now, exempt employees, there are some considerations as well. And that's to that second point in terms of potential changes in pay. You'd be surprised, but we actually get a lot of questions on the comp side where people are so used to viewing their salary on a monthly basis or a yearly basis that when they reduce their hours, occasionally we'll have employees surprised that their check goes down. So be advised from an exempt standpoint, it, your pay will go down by a product of the FTE deduction. So it, believe it or not, that is something to, uh, to address and bring up to, to employees and for employees to realize as well. The other part too, which you may be aware of, is the FLSA minimum um, earnings threshold for most exempt employees is $47,476. So if you've got an exempt employee fairly close to that threshold or having an FTE reduction that might take them under that threshold, there may be some restrictions there to, that may limit how much you can reduce that FTE from an earnings standpoint. So something to consider beforehand. And lastly, the unemployment point, we do get some questions here, especially on nine and 10 month schedules where um, employees you know, may have summers off uh, or several months off. Uh, during that time, even though you're not scheduled to work and not being paid, 
you are still an active employee of the university, so you would not be able to file an unemployment claim and get paid unemployment while you're still an employee here. So we do get that question from time to time as well. So those are the most common inquiries we get, but uh, are there any comp specific questions before I turn it over to Gail? Amber Lee. <laughs> Terrific question, Amber Lee. And I think, and, and the question was, if someone's working remotely and they have to come to back into campus for a meeting, is that paid? I'll honestly have to look at the regs to confirm, but my understanding is because that home office for that day is their assigned work location, coming in for a meeting is assigned work uh, travel time and would likely be paid. But I can confirm those specifics if, as those come up. Question. Yeah, I think that's in reference of 37 and a half hours out of 40. You're right, we do have some employees on campus that are working 37 and a half out of 30 doing the seven and a half, 1.9. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the F and Gail, feel free to step in. I apologize, the comp guy getting math messed up earlier with the FTE math. You're exactly right. Um, it would have to be the 0.75 out of that 37 and a half total. You couldn't cross that weekly hours. So thank you. And actually, that's a good transition to Gail. <laughs> See if I'm coordinated enough to hold both microphones at once. Um, Hi, so I think that would be 28.125, yeah, hours that you would work out of a, if you're working a 37 and a half hour work week. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about your benefits and how those are impacted by the flexible work arrangements. More or less, as long as you're working 75%, so 30 hours out of a 40 hour work week or the 28.125, your benefits at the university will not be impacted. You will still retain the full credit towards the cost of your health insurance. And why is that important? That, that credit, depending on whether you have single coverage or family coverage, varies between about 500 and 1,000. I'm, I'm estimating my dollars per month. So that's certainly something that you're going to want to make certain that that continues um, with the reduced seasonal hours, or at least to be aware of and plan ahead. Um, also, the 10% match to your 5% contribution um, is actually a 200% match of your 5% or the 10% that's out of your pay for your retirement contributions. That depends on you working at least 75% FTE. So um, there are some little tricks and I, I had mentioned, you know, if you do reduce your hours and um, you're going, you happen to have a pay that doesn't cover the cost of your benefits, you can definitely reach out to us and I would even advise reach out to us ahead of time if you were looking at any of these scenarios and have us look at you know your exact situation and then we can talk to you about if any of the cost of benefits will will change or vary but if you do miss a premium being deducted from a paycheck the system will automatically catch up those premiums once you're you know, putting in hours again or in obtaining pay. So, or we can also plan on and pull it, pull ahead of your leaving. But most of the time, unless you're gonna be gone for two or more months, we prefer just to catch those premiums up. A little trick is if you work at least one day of the month, you will receive the health credit. So let's say that you're going to want to be off for two months in the summer. What I would recommend is, let's say it's June and July, work June 1st, as long as that's a working day, and work July 31st. So you will receive the health credit in June and July because you've worked one day. 
but you were off for eight weeks. Um, another thought is, uh, like I said, if you reduce your 75%, you, you do lose the health credit. However, with the Affordable Care Act, there's a period of 12 months called the stability period. So if you're in a position and you are reducing that for a period of less than 12 months, that health credit is going to continue. Uh, what you do not retain is the 10% match. So something to think about. And I feel like I could be a poster child for, this was way before the seasonal um, reduced hours or, or changes, but I, I went to 50%. This was about 18 years ago. And I stayed there for two and a half years because I had young children. And um, it, was, it was wonderful. And I really attribute that to partly for me being here today because I don't know, you know, it really made me feel more of a dedicated employee to the university. And at the 50%, of course, I did, I did lose the match to the retirement um, and I lost my health credit. But it was, you know, for, for me and my personal situation and my work life situation, it was very much worth it. I worked Monday through Thursday, five hours each day. I think I worked from eight to two, took my lunch hour. And that allowed me to leave at two o'clock and pick my children up from school. And then, then in the summers, I worked two 10 hour days, Tuesday and Thursday. So I just wanted to share that with you. Any questions on benefits before I turn it over to our business officer expert? Ward Sutton. Here you go. Hi there. Um, so again, on my, uh, my, I'd like to echo kind of what Gail said and what Dan and Chris have said too, is if you are considering this, let's start early. Um, I can't tell you how many times it, within HR itself, um, very conscientious managers that we have have said, um, so such persons coming to me and they want to work four 10 hour days or they want to work four days and one day, you know, drop down to the 0.75. Um, but we, we set up a meeting and we sat down because we really need to look at different things where the SAP system can really help you to manage your employee and manage their time and such um, if you can get ahead of the game. So number one, I'd like to just say, you know, just set up yourself with a meeting face-to-face -face and kind of look at things uh, with the employee so that everybody can be on the same page. Um, I know that the summer reduced um, that we're gonna talk about the next meeting has a great form online where you almost have to map everything out what are you going to do on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? What's my schedule going to be? It could be so, you know, really just using that form to help yourself out. Just get down on paper. What is it we want to do here? The reason I bring that up is the number one point I have up on the board is the work schedule rule. If you are going to switch to example for 10 hours, we can go into SAP and create a rule in there that says this is a, an employee who works for 10 hour days which will help you with your leave quota, your time entry, if you're all on the employee self-service site and you're entering your own time. It also helps with your absences, and that's probably the part that, you know, when you're on a leave, you're thinking about working, working, working. Well, you know, what if I want to take Tuesday off, and Tuesday's my 10-hour day, and I want to put in 10 hours of leave, potentially. If, if you haven't worked with me in advance, you're going to get blocked from entering those 10 hours because you don't have the right work schedule rule in place to help yourself out. So... Um, by knowing it almost exactly every single day, what your schedule will be, and, and we have a, an employee in the work life office, and uh, two of them have participated in the summer reduced hours, and one of them has now kept that as their permanent schedule, but we have on paper exactly how many hours they're going to work per week, what their schedule is, and then when the holidays come, and the uh, regular just vacation or TDL day comes, we, we know what the system can handle and how they should enter their time. So it just pays off greatly. When, they're, uh, when it's done in advance and everybody's kind of got on paper exactly what their schedule will be. Um, as Dan kind of mentioned, the effects on pay. You know, the biweekly employee who's paid at an hourly rate, they don't necessarily have to adjust that because they're just going to get paid for the number of hours they work. However, as the business officer, if it is an exempt monthly paid employee, I've got to go in and reduce that monthly pay so the system automatically reduces their pay to the appropriate amount. With, again, as Gail had said, you know, understanding that if you're lowering your pay, that's going to affect your life insurance coverage too and such. So there are just little things just to keep in mind that, you know, you, you what you're touching so many things when you reduce your schedule, just 
again, that one-on-one -on -one meeting really helps to cover that base. So if you've paid for a doc, even if you're just getting the basic life insurance, if you're not paying for it, the, your department is, you're gonna affect that coverage, which again, if you have children and family members counting on that, you need to know that. Um, again, as I said earlier, um, if based on the timing of the issue, you know how the holiday quota gets dropped early. Um, if you are somebody who's gonna go on holiday leave or, or reduced leave, sorry, flexible schedule, in July or you know Memorial Day or Fourth of July holiday quota may be affected, and then I can if it's already posted I can work with the EAG team to get that to the correct number of hours you you should be working. So if you're you know if you should only get six hours of holiday because you're working a reduced schedule instead of eight, we can go in and fix that by contacting the EAG team. By the same token, when you get back and Labor Day rolls around and you only have six hours of Labor Day holiday, but you're back at an eight-hour schedule we contact the AG again that says, hey, this person's off summer reduced hours, give them the two hours that they need to be off for Labor Day. So again, it's one of those things where it almost, it almost never ends until it ends. So, but again, planning ahead keeps, allows you to keep track of that and working with your business officer. And again, a little onus on the employee to keep an eye on their quotas and what's, what's dropping down and such. And then lastly, again, the, the date range, setting that up in advance. And what I do is I go ahead and put in um, between, I mean, again, it's going to surprise you all, I get nerdy when this stuff happens, but I'll put in an Outlook meeting reminder between myself and the employee and say, hey, you said you were coming back on August 10th. On August 1st, I go in and put a reminder. Hey, you know, 10 days, you said you're going to come off your flex schedule, or you're going to come off your summer reduced schedule. Oh, no, no, Lord, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, we're coming back, I'm coming back today. Okay, good, good notice, let's get it fixed, we'll get it fixed to the system, we'll get it done. And so even just using Outlook to continuously remind everybody who's off, who's coming back, what are we doing, just to keep everything in front of you so you can be proactive instead of reactive. So, um, so again, I have to advocate for my position at the university and say, yeah, if we can do this in advance, great. You know, it really does help everybody know what's happening. And, um, you know, when you're coming back, when you're going on, you know, all that stuff. So that's really my point is just, you know, you can help yourself out a lot just by doing it in advance. Do you guys have any questions Somebody wants to take a day without a week without pay, and I have an exempt employee for two years now who has taken off um, a solid week of time without pay because they have young children, they have already have their vacation mapped out and stuff. And so by working with me, we went in and we put them on a leave without pay for um, the first day, and then I would put a, put an action in SAP to stop that pay, and then I do a return from leave without pay. Again, I've met with the manager, I've met with the employee, I've approved everything in advance, but it's simply getting those actions entered in SAP, which should reduce their pay appropriately and handle all the benefit while maintaining their benefits and such. So that's a simple one. If it's just a week or so, then that's easily done. But communication is crucial. Um, but um, if it's again, yeah, the question again is if, if an office has say four or five people in it and people want to, one person a week gets to work a four day week for 10 hours say, and then they rotate. Um, from an SAP point of view, um, it wouldn't, if it's just going to be for the one week and they're, for example, if they're exempt and they're not going to take any leave requests or anything and it doesn't really affect anything, they haven't changed the fact that they're going to work 40 hours in the week. They, you know, as long as they don't take any leave requests or anything during the week that could, could offset that. So and that's very minor. I mean, 
Um, basically, from an SAP business officer point of view, if the four people in work, work life wanted to do that and they were all exempt, that would work. If they were non-exempt, I might want to go in and do an action again just to help them with their entering of hours and any absences that might happen. But from an SAP point of view, it should work just fine um, without, again, as long as everybody's just going to come to work every day, that should work fine. So I'll ask Zeta if you want to ask about you know the arrangement part of it just to see if that needs to be any more stuff. That's a great question. <laughs> So you can, we do like to keep records of that. Um, even though it's temporary, um, you, you can put in the notice that you submit online, the time frame for it. So we always prefer to have it, but it's not required because it's an agreement within your department. As long as you are okay with it and you know, like you said, there's no change in terms of leave and things like that. Uh, we love to know about it. We want to know about it. But um, if you guys have worked out the arrangement, it works for you, then we're ex mainly your, you, everyone is excited in your department and it's a win-win, so. Other, yes. Hi, that's right. You do accrue it at a reduced schedule. And what um, a lot of people be, are confused by, let's say like in my scenario years ago where I was working two 10-hour days, and let's say July 4th holiday landed on Thursday, which was one of the days I would work. I'm at 50%, so I receive four hours of holiday pay. It's a 10-hour day that I put in, so if I don't want to work the other six hours, I take six hours of vacation. But exactly, if I'm accruing, let's say 20 days a year, because I've been here for a while, um, that would be, I would actually be accruing 10 eight hour days or 80 hours instead of 160 at 50%. I thought I should better clarify earlier the the leave without payday did happen ironically during the summer reduced hour time period. So, um, you know, that really was, you know, something again where there's that online form that everybody filled out, the supervisor approved came to me. So, um, you know, just to let you know, again, that was one of those summer reduced period time periods, which may have made it a little easier to be on leave without pay. Mm -hmm. I know we try to obviously get people to use their leave appropriately and to make sure that, you know, if you're off, we want you to get paid. But in this case, the employee came up with the idea of taking the, the whole week off without pay. Supervisor approved it, and it all worked out. So, just a quick clarity there. During the summer reduced hours program, the question was if, if it's up to the supervisor to approve the leave. Yeah, it definitely would be because you you know you're going to be absent. So any absence, you know, generally the system sends it through to the supervisor to get approval. So it's I mean, basically, yeah. I think, again, that's, that's, what, that's where the summer reduced hours came from, is either reducing your schedule or taking leave altogether because there's not a great need for you to, your department is slow on the demand. And um, it, again, it's a, from being the budget officer, business officer, it's a win because obviously you're, you're not paying out salary, so you're saving a little bit on budget such. But again, the, the workload of the department comes first. The needs of the department always come first. So Speaking, speaking just as a non-supervisor, I'd say definitely I'd like to when the supervisor and I sit down with the employee to say, you know, this, you know, that way they can't say later on, well, Ward said I could be off for four weeks, you know, that kind of stuff, so, which never happens. But, uh, but yeah. So, Amber Lee? Yeah. 
that that yeah 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 that's a great yeah that's great the question from Amberly is just to confirm is if you do have leave quota available to you should you use it and, and the answer is you know obviously we try to we want again we want you to use your leave but right right yeah in the, in the situation where I've experienced in HR, the employee and the supervisors had done, and she had already mapped out all of her leave type, leave requests for the rest of the year. So she knew when she was gonna use up all of her leave and when they were gonna take it. So she, if she took all of her leave, she wouldn't have any leave for, at some point she's gonna be out of leave anyway. So the advantage is that in the summer reduced time period, we allow you to go unpaid. It's one of the caveats of the program if you choose to go unpaid. So that's why we utilize it during that time because it does state that you can either reduce your time or go unpaid. So, but you don't have to, right? You don't have to, right? Yeah. 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 We, we, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can research that more. But in the case where the person had mapped everything out, we did choose to do that with the supervisor present. Yeah. I think, Amberly, in the case where somebody's not in a reduced seasonal hours, this is Gail, um, that we have always followed that if you have leave in your bank, you need to take that first. I think systematically, that's how everything is set up. So it, it I mean, in some ways, if you look at it, six of one half dozen of another, because whether they take it now or they take it later, it just, to me, it just confuses, it makes it administratively more complex. But um, that's, that is the way I understand it. Okay. Building on that question, let's jump over to 50. Let's say you're at 75%, you work Monday through Friday, and you're still working Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to work Friday instead. Mm -hmm. And then you would not have to turn in your sick leave on Monday and work three days. I think that so, as long as that's okay with your department, okay. that is very doable. Yeah. to this last slide here just some really quick tips if you're thinking about working from home and some of these you have already heard from our wonderful panelists so I'll just go through them fairly quickly but one making sure you have dedicated space that's organized is very helpful um, having a routine you know again working during your work hours having a routine working that into your family's rhythm so if you are if you have young children, you're getting them off to school in the morning and they go off to school and you go to work. <laughs> so having a rhythm and making sure people know just because you're home, you're not home, so to speak, you're working at home. Um, so just keep that in mind um, and don't expect to do it all. So it is as if you were to go to work, you have to stop at some point and that's that. So keeping within those hours that you set for your day, um, establishing expectations with your employers. So that's just Again, what am I gonna get done? What are my projects that I'm working on? What needs to be done? And I'm gonna get those things done. Um, celebrate rewards together. That's just, again, if you're making, if you were on, on site, oftentimes people know that you've reached certain milestones, you got certain things done, you reached goals. So just continue to communicate with your team, with your supervisor to make sure they know, okay, you know, they know what you've accomplished. Um, be a role model, that's just, doing a good job basically just making sure that if you say you're working you're working <laughs> um, evaluate adjust and monitor so this is a good one for the supervisor and the employee to consider you want to think about is this working if it's not working what do we need to do to adjust this to make it work if that's possible um, do something for yourself every day that's again just working through but enjoying the fact that um, you, you're in this flexible work scenario, but you do have to get your work done and staying healthy. So getting up and walking around, I know for all of us that probably have desk jobs, we tend to sit a lot, right? Like I know oftentimes I'll say, I'm gonna get up and move around and three hours later, I'm still sitting there. 
So little things when you're at home and you're you're working through it, same thing. Get up, have some stretch breaks, take a walk, come back. Are there any additional questions? I'm going to let Ward talk to that because that's the first I had ever heard that. So, <laughs> we have, I mean, all I can confirm is we have executed it with the, with the supervisor present recognizing that, you know, they had met that she had stated that she had um, mapped out her vacation request for the year and it worked better for her to take that time as unpaid. Um, the supervisor acknowledged that, she understood how that would Im impact the employee and, and, and they did proceed with the action and we've done it two years in a row now. So we've, there's a very limited experience, but it was with a lot of careful forethought. Now this is a relatively new employee too, who doesn't earn a great deal of vacation every year. She has a, a young family and everything. So I'm not trying to tell too many tales here. I'm just trying to say, you know, she's uh, got a family. She's mapped out time off and realizes that this was the best alternative for her. Oh, and she's done it two years in a row. Now, perhaps maybe when she gets more time and accrues more time as she's been here longer, as her accruals grow up, maybe she, you know, again, just takes vacation. But this was her best option. So we did execute it with the supervisor's full knowledge. Enough for her to run down and the they didn't have enough for the full week. I know that much. I remember the first year they did not have a full week at all. So there's no way they could have taken it paid anyway. Yeah, we get that question a lot under family medical leave. So under under Department of Labor rules. You know, family medical by itself is an unpaid leave, but the university policy does say that you have to, have to use all available sick and or vacation time during that leave period. So we do get people who could say, gee, can I take family medical unpaid, then take a vacation leave multiple months down the road? So the, the answer is no, you cannot do that under family medical. And then the summer, May 6th, this year is May 6th through August 18th. So during that time frame, you can take an unpaid week off. And I do believe you can have vacation because I've done that. <laughs> have vacation in the bank and I still call if, if I wanted to. But um, so from <laughs> my experience, it was just during that time though. It was not just like any time I think I want to do it. It was during that sanctioned time by the university that you can opt for those two options, either reduce your hours or take a full week off by like eight. I think that's the that's thing that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Any final questions? Yes. So requirement is a good word. <laughs> uh, we would love to. It is not currently, we're not going to police it so much. It is an agreement with that supervisor and the employee. So we would love to, 
say, yes, please submit the, the form. We want you to. But we also know that there's people on campus that just have an agreement with their supervisor and they work half a day on Wednesdays and that's okay. It works for them. So, you know, back to the, we want the agreement, yes, but we also know that some people do it because sometimes it's not like a set standard schedule. It's just kind of every now and then when they need to, and that works for them. So that's the best answer I think I can give for that. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you guys so much. Thank you to our Zoom participants as well. And we will have a session specifically talking about reduced summer schedules on May 10th, same time, same location. Thank you guys.